Topic 6.8, biotechnology. Here are some of the questions that we'll be addressing. What is recombinant DNA? How can it be artificially created? How can you create recombinant bacterial plasmids that can express human genes? What is gel electrophoresis? What is PCR? What is sequencing? I'm Mr. W from learn-biology.com, where we believe that interaction and feedback is what leads to deep, substantial learning. We're so sure of that, that we provide a money-back guarantee that comes with your subscription. Explain what recombinant DNA is and how it can be artificially created. Recombinant DNA is DNA that's been combined from more than one source. During meiosis, you would create recombinant DNA as you combine the DNA that you inherited from your parents in the form of new gametes. But this is artificial recombinant DNA. It's DNA from more than one source shown over here that might have bacterial DNA with a snippet of human DNA with more bacterial DNA. So DNA artificially combined more than one source. It's been recombined. The main tool in creating recombinant DNA is something called a restriction enzyme, shown over here at letter C. What these restriction enzymes do is they find sequences of DNA that are called restriction sites. So here's one at B, and they cut the DNA, here's the DNA, with sticky ends. And you can see these sticky ends over here. Those sticky ends are exposed to single strands of nucleotides. You see that over here in this diagram that shows the DNA double helix. And those single strands are able to form hydrogen bonds with complementary bases. The result of using a restriction enzyme shown over here, shown over here, are restriction fragments. So here's a fragment over here. Here's another fragment over here. If you cut a second piece of DNA, for example, a piece of human DNA with the same restriction enzymes, what you'll wind up having are complementary sticky ends. Because of complementarity, the ends of the two pieces will form hydrogen bonds. That's what you see happening over here. And then you need to use another enzyme, it's called DNA ligase, and that creates sugar phosphate bonds connecting the strands, creating recombinant DNA. Using restriction enzymes and DNA ligase, you can create a recombinant plasmid with a human gene. Explain how. Note, for this question, assume that introns have already been removed from the human DNA. The first step is to extract a plasmid from a bacterial cell and then cut open that plasmid with restriction enzyme, leaving sticky ends the way that we just described in the previous slide. Use the same restriction enzyme to cut out a target human gene, and therefore the ends will be complementary. Because they've been cut with the same restriction enzymes, the human gene will combine with the plasmid, forming hydrogen bonds between their complementary sticky ends. Then you have to use DNA ligase, we referred to that in the previous slide, it's not shown here, to bind the human DNA and plasma DNA together, creating a recombinant plasmid that contains a human gene. Then you'd insert the plasmid into a bacterial cell. That's using the technique of transformation, which we previously referred to when we talked about horizontal gene transfer. This genetically engineered recombinant bacteria, this over here and its descendants over here, will produce the human protein and produce the plasmid in every reproduction cycle. This is how genetically engineered insulin has been created. That means bacterial cells that produce a human protein that's widely used. In order for the genes for human proteins, such as insulin, to be expressed in bacteria, introns need to be removed. Explain why and how. To review, Introns are non-coding sequences of DNA within eukaryotic genes that have to be spliced out before the gene's RNA can be translated into protein. Here's human DNA. There are exons that are expressed sequences, and they're separated from one another by introns, these intervening sequences. The consequence of the presence of introns is that to transfer a human gene to a bacterium to create a gene product you have to use DNA from which the introns have been 
removed. The bacteria would just translate everything, including the introns, and that would lead to a non-functional protein. How do you remove the introns? You have to do it before transforming the bacterial cells, and you can do it in two ways. The first method involves determining the amino acid sequence for the protein. Biochemists can look at a protein like insulin and figure out what the linear sequence of amino acids is. Once you do that, you use your genetic code chart to reverse engineer DNA that codes for that amino acid sequence. Another method is shown here. What you do is you find cells that produce the desired protein, you extract mRNA from those cells that codes for this protein. That mRNA already has had its introns removed, and then you use the enzyme reverse transcriptase. That's an enzyme that's in retroviruses, which are viruses that are RNA-based but can create a DNA copy of themselves that gets incorporated into the human cell that they've infected. HIV is an example of one such virus. You use reverse transcriptase, which is shown here at B, to create cDNA complementary DNA from the RNA, and then you insert that complementary DNA into the plasmid, and that's how you do your successful genetic engineering. What is gel electrophoresis? How is it used to analyze DNA? Gel electrophoresis is a technique that's widely used. It's used to sort molecules by size and or electrical charge. It's the basis of a technique that's called restriction fragment analysis, also called DNA fingerprinting, widely used in forensics. It involves placing molecules in a porous gel. Here's the gel over here at number five. That is in a device, an apparatus, a box, that can produce an electrical current. So you'd run an electrical current generated over here through the gel. Because DNA's phosphate groups, shown over here, are negatively charged, DNA fragments will move away from the negatively charged side of the electrophoresis chamber. So you put the DNA over here, like repels like, negative charge, negative charge, and that's gonna push the DNA in this direction. The small fragments will be impeded by the gel less than the large fragments. So over time, the smaller fragments will move more than the larger fragments, enabling the fragments to be sorted by size. By the end of the process, you'd have here DNA with one large fragment, here DNA with two fragments, and here DNA that's been cut into three fragments. How would it be cut? By restriction enzymes. So you use a combination of these techniques to get results like this as you're analyzing DNA. Is AP Bio making you feel overwhelmed and inadequate? That's completely reasonable. At learn-biology.com, we understand why students struggle with AP Bio. The material is complex, the pace is brutal, and the vocabulary is ridiculous. But at learn-biology.com, we've created a way that makes it easier for you to study. Go to learn-biology.com, sign up for a free trial, and complete our interactive tutorials and interactive AP Bio exam reviews. We guarantee you a four or a five on the AP Bio exam. See you on learn-biology.com. Material related to biotechnology often shows up on the AP Bio exam in this form. Here's a simple restriction mapping problem. A 20 kilobase plasmid, KB kilobase, has several restriction sites. The image on the right shows the results of electrophoresis following various combinations of restriction enzymes. Which lane shows the gel that would result if the plasmid were digested with the restriction enzyme BAMH1? This line over here indicates a restriction site that's been labeled with BAMH1. So there's a restriction site over here for BAMH1, a second one over here, and a third. The entire plasmid is 20 kilobases, and the map is telling you that this is a three kilobase difference. So if you cut the plasmid with BAMH1, you'd wind up with three fragments. Here's one. Here's a second one, it would start here, go all the way down to here, and here's a third one that would start here, 
go all the way up to here. The first one would be three kilobases in size. The second one would be 11 kilobases in size. How did I do that? Three kilobases plus eight equals 11. And the last one is six kilobases in size. And what that means is that you'd have to look over here at the gel and you'd say, oh, this fragment is 11 kilobases. This fragment is six kilobases and this one is three. Perfect. That means B would be your answer if this were on a multiple choice test. What is PCR? What is it used for? PCR stands for polymerase chain reaction. The polymerase is DNA polymerase. It's a cell-free technique for cloning DNA. In other words, you can clone DNA in a test tube. You don't need a cell in order to do it. It requires the DNA sample that you want to clone. It's shown over here at A. It requires primers. Those are short strands of single-strand DNA that bind to sequences at the start of the DNA that you want to amplify. So here is a primer, and here you see the primer binding to the target DNA. It requires heat-resistant DNA polymerase, shown over here at G. That would be a large protein. Why does it need to be heat resistant? Because the process involves repeated cycles of heating and cooling, and you need a DNA polymerase that won't be denatured by the heating process. Where do you find it? From bacteria and archaea that live in hot springs. And you also need free nucleotides that are going to be used for DNA synthesis, because what we're doing is we're making lots of DNA from a sample that we want to amplify. How does it work? It involves repeated cycles of heating the DNA to separate it into different strands. So here's the DNA. You heat it, you break those hydrogen bonds, and now you've separated it into single strands. That's step one over here. Then you cool the DNA enough so that primers can bind to it and so that DNA polymerase can synthesize new DNA. That's shown at two and it's shown at three. The DNA polymerase will read the template strand and it'll seal uh, sugar phosphate bonds between the nucleotides that bind with the template strands. So here you are, uh, you're seeing DNA polymerase creating new DNA. And every heating and cooling cycle will double the amount of DNA. So we started with one piece of DNA. Now we have two pieces of DNA. That's an exact copy of the original DNA. Do it again. You have four pieces of DNA. Do it again and you'll have eight pieces of DNA. After 10 cycles, you have a thousand times more DNA than you started with. And after 30 cycles, you've amplified your DNA a billion fold. This is widely used in any kind of science that needs to work with DNA. It's widely used in forensics where little DNA samples from a crime scene, for example, are amplified so that they can be analyzed for electrophoresis, DNA fingerprinting, etc. What is DNA sequencing? What are some of its uses? DNA sequencing, you just need to know what it is. You don't really need to know how it's done, though if you're interested in seeing how it's done, you can do that at learn-biology.com. DNA sequencing involves taking a sample of DNA, anything from a small fragment to the entire genome of an organism, and figuring out the specific sequence of A, T, C, and G nucleotides that make it up. It allows biologists to determine what proteins an organism can produce. It's used to infer evolutionary relationships, and it's used by cancer biologists to sequence tumors to see what genetic mutations are causing the cells to become cancerous. During the COVID-19 pandemic, sequencing was used to analyze the emergence of new SARS-CoV-2 variants, and of course it was used in order to create the vaccine. In forensic, sequencing is being used along with DNA fingerprinting to identify and exonerate suspects and resolve paternity disputes. Want to learn more? Sign up for a free trial of the website that guarantees your AP Biology success. Learn-biology.com and watch this next video.